This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Okay, it's a little bit of a different video today, certainly a lot longer than usual, and let me tell you where this all stems from. You may recall that a few weeks ago I did a video on the basics of home recording, home recording for beginners, that sort of thing. And I started getting a few emails after that video, uh, which were kind of asking questions that were a bit more advanced than I felt comfortable answering, you know, um, I know my limitations, basically. So I thought I'd uh, bring in an expert to have a natter about uh, home recording and other such matters. So that's what we're doing today. We're going to be uh, talking to someone who is very, very definitely an expert on such matters. Uh, before we get into that, let me just apologise to begin with for the rather uh, dodgy uh, picture quality on my sections of the interview, because um, about an hour before I was going to do the interview on Zoom, uh, my camera, the one that I'm talking to you on now, um, had a bit of a nervous breakdown and completely refused to play nice with me PC. So I had to dig an old webcam out of a drawer and do the uh, the interview on that. So in case you're thinking, well, the picture looks a bit uh, grainy, that's why. Anyway, what can I tell you about the guest that I've got lined up for you today? Well, he's called Steve Hoggett. And um, Steve and my paths have been crossing regularly for about the past 30 years or so. He's a great lad. And he is the bass player with legendary T-side bands, The Amazing Space Frogs and Riot Act. He's also a college lecturer in music technology. Um, he is a studio owner. He is a producer, he is a session musician, and he's done just about every uh, job in the music industry, from being uh, the tech guy in the studio who fixes broken equipment right the way through to going out on tour with bands on the road as a tour manager. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge and, you know, a lot of uh, rather good anecdotes, uh, that some of which made it into this interview, uh, to go along with it. So without further ado, here he is, Mr. Steve Hogg. It. So, if I can just fire a few questions at you, and uh, you can answer mm -hmm. the questions that I didn't, you know, that people were posing to me that I didn't feel uh, qualified to ask. Compression, yeah. first of all. Uh, what, I mean, again, it's one of those things I've stumbled about with, and my opinion is that um, the person who wrote the preset probably knows a lot more about it than I do, so I'll just trust their judgment and, and use presets. Um, you know, if it says it's for driving bass guitar or driving rock bass, then that's the one I'll use. So how do you take a more nuanced approach to, to c compression, for example? What, what are the parameters? What should you be listening for? And, and what should you, how should you use it? I think the key thing is to understand how a compressor works. And basically all it's going to do is when your level gets above, there's, there's your compressor threshold yep. set. Yep. Now. And basically you're going to set when the compressor works mm -hmm. how low how high you want it to work yeah. when it hits that what we call threshold mm -hmm. you can determine how much the signal is going to be compressed yeah. fundamentally reduced in level yeah um um I, I read a really good analogy of it the other day it's like your mother shouting upstairs and all that but then that got complicated because it was like they were talking about the attack and the release mm -hmm. but what i like to think of is there's your compressor. Mm -hmm. Your compressor's this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then this is your threshold by yep. your hand going yep. up and down to the amount of compression. And what it's looking at is the amount of gain reduction. So how much it's going to take that signal down by how much, by how much you set the compressor. A very simple compressor will just take the signal down by a certain amount. But the key things... Um, that you that you need to worry about something called boop, 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 boop. <laughs> the key things that you need to worry about is what they call the attack, how long it takes to compress, and okay. the decay, how long it takes for the compression to come back down. If you have a very slow attack, it'll let the initial dynamics of your signal come through. So if you're playing slap bass, it'll let 
them initial transients come through, which is part of the sound of the slap bass. If you're applying it onto guitar and you just want to even it out, what you can do is send, send a little gentle compression. So there's our level again. Mm -hmm. And it's just keeping everything at the same level. Um, I have one in the, um, in the signal chain all the time with, uh, with young or experienced players. I'm not knocking them back here at all. All it does is it makes my life loads easier. They come out their guitar, and there's another reason for this. They go into me little... Um, I'd have to break it out over the other side of the room. I have a little compressor that basically says compress and not compress, you know, more or less. Yes. And what it does, it evens their playing out. Mm -hmm. so it evens the playing out. So it's all nice and even. So when I record, when, whatever amp they're going to, they feed the front of the amp a little bit better. Um, the other thing that comes out of my lovely little compressor pedal is a DI of their signal. Now, the reason I use the DI, when I, re I record everything with the DI, because it's dead spiky and it's dead easy to edit, and I'm lazy, so it makes life a bit quicker. So if you could just do a little bit of jargon busting for us there. You, you've explained... Um, you know the um, the attack and the, the release. There's one thing that you know that that perplexes me when I'm looking at um, you know the parameters, especially on a, a compressor plugin. Knee, as in K N E E. What's that? When 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 your compressor's compressing, mm -hmm. it has two fundamental ways of compressing the signal. It can compress it hard, so it's just going to. Well, anything that comes in is going to get compressed like that, or it can do it in more of a gentle curve. Oh, okay. So it's it's how hard the... Um, what I'm a big fan of is, because I'm as old as the hills, and I grew up with loads and loads of different compressors, and when we, we would have a different compressor in the studio to do a different thing, and some of them will be hard needs, some of them will be soft needs. So a soft need compressor, will give you a more gentle sounding compression. Um, so it's a little bit smoother. Uh, a hard need is like bang straight there. It's getting to, you can set that hard need compression up as predominantly a limiter. Well, a limiter is very different to a compressor. That there's our level that we set mm -hmm. and it can't go up anymore. So that it limits the signal going through where a compressor will rise up a bit, but it, it'll reduce the peaks. Got you. So you'll still have the peaks. Right, next question. Um, or oh, before we move on from compression, um, if somebody's just getting into home recording, um, and I mean, you know, the, the, there's loads of DAWs out there, are, and most of them have like sort of native plugins that um, that come along with with the software. Um, are those good enough, or is the one like kind yeah, of fine. absolute? Yeah, yeah, fine. I didn't no, know if it was worth. I didn't no, know if no, it was no. worth um, um, kind of spending um, money on on a on a plugin that you see kind of advertised or whatever. Took me years. Took me years to get into using um, a computer for home, and then I get mm -hmm. me head around uh, fixing and building a computer, and then specking it up, and then making sure if it goes wrong, I can fix it on the fly. As my knowledge was developing there, um, I'm a big Steinberg fan. I'm just mm -hmm. cut me in half, and it says Cubase and Wave Lab because I've used them since 1984 when they come out. Um, Wave Lab didn't come out in '84, but I'm, uh, Cubase was a thing called Pro 12. But um, when you talk about the native plugins, the native plugins in Cubase now are copies of are emulations of really, really good compressors. Got you. Um, and I think it just learn how to use your compression first. I mean, I, I was really lucky in the first proper studio that I worked in is we had, um, we all had the same compressors. So I got to know them really well. So I got to know that really well. So when I went to work in Londonicus, um, when I come across 1176 and LA-2As, which are like posh compressors, mm -hmm. um, I I heard the sound first, not yeah. the compression. Got you. 
So the important thing is, is what do you want sound right? This is why these Cali 76s have done really well and all the bass players are using them now. Because they sound like an 1176. Um, if I could just say one thing to your lovely listeners and lovely watchers, um, err on the side of the amount of compression that you bung on something. Unless you're going for a tone, unless you're going for a sound, a really squashed, yeah, big breathing tone thing. So it just kind of gently does it, are you saying? Yeah, yeah. Until you know what you're doing with it, then you can cane its ass. <laughs> so, next question. Um, recording instruments. Um, you know, you go into, let's say, for just to pluck a name out of the air, you go out of, you, you go into Abbey Road Studios or I don't know, the power station or, or like a big famous international studio. I don't get the impression they're going to be using much in the way of, um, you know, kind of amp sims and plugins and stuff like that there. Okay. Uh, everything will presumably be mic'd by guys who know loads about miking up and, and getting the best sounds. So, is it worth if you're recording at home learning how to mic up a guitar amp yes. or, or or can you just I get away can, using can i can i throw a cat among the pigeons here yeah. can i just quickly show you something go on yeah bunch of amps more up oh yes yeah. yeah lots of amplifiers next question <laughs> no, seriously, seriously um, I've got a great technique for um, your listeners to get a better feel of the guitar mm -hmm. going through a plug-in um, and he's off Can't today. All me pedals and things are all over there. I can't. I can't remember it today. You know, Behringer do a valve distortion pedal for about forty quid. Yep. Plug that in the front. Don't worry about putting any. It doesn't suck your tone a great deal. It does a bit, but you, what you get back is the, the 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 touch of driving the front end of a valve. So is that to use in front of a plug-in? Yeah. 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 So if, if you bung that straight into your audio interface, audio interface, the quality, yes, some are good, some are bad. Um, I haven't heard many bad now. Mm -hmm. So as far as plugins go, get cracked on. Just I would prefer you to write some music. I would prefer you to have some fun rather than spending hours um, researching and looking for how they got the clay man guitar sound by yeah. in flames um <clears throat> which that's a decent tone you know what i mean um i've been down this this is why i've got just up here i've got a little mixer that mm -hmm. i use for combining um guitar channels together because i'm sick of having too many options i've gone back old school i recorded um uh, a mate who plays in a, a, a psychobilly band called the Angmen, and he uses two different amps one mm -hmm. for his kind of his bass sound and one for his treble sound but they it, it runs in stereo he's got a slap back so you could run it in stereo or you could run it in dual mono mm -hmm. um and after recording him that's when i got that so i could combine it and go there it's done so to go back to um what one do i use bias um yeah. it's class yeah, I... <laughs> I've got the whole Line 6 suite, mm -hmm. um, but I don't use them. I use them more for the pedals, mm -hmm. um, and I got the metal pack or whatever, mm -hmm. because I, I do more rock and metal bands and things. Um, but yeah, they're cool. Yeah, I mean, bias, I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm with you on that. It's uh, I use it a lot, um, and it's so cheap. For what for what it is, I mean, I've got bias amp, and um, I I think I paid about forty quid for it because there was a deal on, and I was a new customer setting up a new account, so that gave me a, like a discount code, and I think it was all in was about forty quid, and 
you know, it's, it, I mean, it's what I'm, I've played through quite a few amps in my time. Um, I've always been a bit of a martial hound, always loved the sound of a martial. But, you know, I mean, my, the, my experience of martial amps is that when we last one, it was, it was going wrong so much it might as well have got pocket money. It was, you know, it was, it was always kind of going wrong, but it was, it was worth the pain in the wallet yeah, yeah, for, for the yeah. sound that it gave me. And, yeah. you know, the, the, um, the, the plexi and the, um, well, it's not, they don't call it a Marshall plexi model, but that's what it is. And the, uh, the JCM 900 model in, in Biosam, I think they're just outstanding. It, it, yeah, it's, I'm a big fan of the 800. Um, yeah. I've, I've just got a, a project in, um, that I can't really talk talk a great deal about, but they're all 1980s rock band. Um, and I've just had all the files sent over me to mix and master. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, go, the, the compliment and some uh, recordings from back in the day. Um, and I set up um, to reamp last night mm -hmm. uh, with, um, I've got one of them, DSL things anyway that was pants uh, it was all right I've got a couple of decent cabs I've got good enough mics and snazzy preamps and all that crap and I've got a GMP one that's what the humming was sorry um, <laughs> but the GMP one's great you've got a 800 and 900 and all the 800 and 900 is uh, 800 was made in the 80s 900 was made in yeah. the, the 90s and the big difference is the 900 does what we call diode clipping mm-hmm and the diode clipping is a little bit like having a tube screen in front, but it's not a tube screen, so it does the gaininess, mm -hmm. but it doesn't tidy up the bottom end like a tube screamer does. Mm -hmm. um, but now that I'm a Marshall boy myself, it, where I was going with this was, I'm not, I don't think I'll be reamping. I think I'll be using a combination of a, of, of a few things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a real big fan of two note stuff. I've got a little drawer. Um, little drawer that pulls out here that's got my two notes cab, the two notes captor. I've also got, oh God, this is just class, that Bogner Ecstasy. You would love that. I need yeah. to get that over for you to have a player. Honest, John, it's mental. Nice um, one. It's it's a rock. I definitely, I'll get it over for you. Uh, and then an amp egg thing. I had a, a copy of a thing that did uh, a similar thing, but it it wasn't an amp, it didn't have the same tone stack. Anyway, I digress, sorry, sir. No, I was just going to say, so if if in an ideal world, um, making up an amp, we've been talking about plugins, but if in an ideal world, making up an amp is what you should really learn to do, it, how do you go about learning that? I'm, you know, because let's face it, most people are home recording, and the, the, the pertinent word in that description is home recording how do you, how do you kind of get a good cranked marshal for the sake of argument tone how do you get that tone at you know a volume that isn't going to um you know get the noise abatement society on your back and how do you make it up successfully what's what tricks would you suggest there hardest thing here john hardest thing here listeners is you need to know how a mic works before you get something like the torpedo so you okay. need to have a player, even if you're sat at home with your PV Bandit and an old ropey mic, mm -hmm. what you need to do is um, knock up a little drum track, mm -hmm. play along with it, move the mic, play along with it again, move the mic, play along with it again. Then pull the mic away. So um, speaker. Yep. If we're looking on front of the speaker, I know it's a phone, yeah, but I know. Uh, you want one at 45 degree angle, mm -hmm. one right at the front, mm -hmm. yeah? um, and then anywhere kind of in between. Yeah. Then record the same thing again, centre of the cone, go mm -hmm. from the centre of the cone to the edge. But the more centre you go to, the brighter it gets, uh, and it can get a little bit harsh as you move to the edge, it warms up. Once you've got all that sorted and you've done that within three or four inches of the front of the cabinet, move it a little bit further back. Then save that project, open another one up. And what we're going to do now is you're just going to play a nice 
clean sound. You can have chorus on if you want, mm -hmm. but I like a cleaner sound so you can see what's going to happen with the effect of your own. Got you. We stick your, your own mic and this side you need to see side on. So what mm -hmm. we're doing is we're going within like, you know, six inches or so. And then we're going to go back. We're not going to mm -hmm. change anything. We're going to record it again. Now listen to your room. Don't listen to the amp. Got you. Listen to the room. Then combine the two. If you've got two mics and two channels, I'm, I'm going to be doing shed loads of this on my daft little channel. Um, and that putting the two mics and listen to the difference between a condenser and a dynamic, you will as Mr. Person playing in a band or playing guitar or whatever, be able to blag a condenser off someone to have a go over a week. Yeah. Take your time. Listen. Listen on your headphones. Listen on your speakers. More important than anything else is the speakers that you listen to on when you're creating and doing things and the speakers that you listen to on your headphones or, you know, your mm. headphones. Listen to more music on it. So don't have your you know, 60,000 pound audio file system downstairs and only listen to music on there because you're not going to be able to analyze what's going on, which is the key to getting a really good guitar tone. Okay. The experience of listening to them and then buy a wall of sound. <laughs> oh, it's free. Sorry, Steve, what was that? Wall of sound by two notes is free. Oh, okay, right. Well, that's that's another another link that will be uh, in the description. John, that's class. Yeah. John, honestly, it was a game changer for me. I very rarely mic stuff up now um, because I have the two notes captor, which is a, a speaker load, mm -hmm. and then I have the cab, and the cab comes on my machine and allows me to move my mic positions and all that, and it's like it's not worth the hassle. The only time that I use an amp up loud is if we've got noisy guys wanting to get loads of energy in the performance mm -hmm. more than super tight, slick math rock stuff. Which, which brings me to my next point, actually, um, what I was going to ask you about. Um, does perfection matter? No. You know, because I, I remember... Um, Oh, dear me, about 25 years ago, um, I went with a band that I was in at the time into a studio. We were just like a covers, a rock covers band, you know. Um, and I won't mention which studio we went into. Get us told. <laughs> eh? Get us told. It was, it was John Taylor's place in Mask. Um, it's only because I didn't know you had a studio. <laughs> Actually, uh, I've been off the radar for years with it. Yeah. Um, and I always remember Mike Franklin, God rest his soul. Oh, well, you're packing, taking bands in because you're tearing me ass out with what you're doing. <laughs> and I can't compete for the. I said, Look, I'm not a commercial venture. I mean, I am now. And it, sadly, Mike's no longer with us. Anyway, back on. But anyway, you know, as always happens, you, you go into the studio for uh, two or three days, you get four or five songs. I think we did four. Um, and you get home and you listen to the tape on you because it was a cassette in those days uh, on the uh, on on your home stereo and you think oh yeah there you go <laughs> everybody under forty is going what's one of those um, I've got loads here's a one for you I'm simply, sorry to digress but have you heard of these you can't. love these bullfrog bullfrog no can't say I have. Late sixties, guy called Steve Thompson. When I get it done, I'll visit over here. It's class. Nice one. Well, you know, you, you get the tape home and you listen to it and you think, oh, I came in a little bit late on on that uh, solo there. Oh, and I was a me, me kind of me, me rhythm guitar was a bit ahead of the beat on that verse and stuff like that. And I remember, you know, I actually paid out of my own pocket, not out of the band's kind of money i actually paid to go back in to book some more time in the studio to go and redo my yeah, part interview you drink and so that's yeah. not a good start and everybody else in the band was saying yeah it's fine don't worry about it but you know it you know when i listened back to what i'd done in the end we ended up using the original um demo that we'd done because it, it just it was us playing together as a band and it wasn't me going in and fixing things later do you think there's so much of an emphasis on perfection nowadays 
yeah, a couple of things with regard to that, John. Um, I, I've, could you think of it being any worse where the equipment's not um, getting in the way of the tone that you're pursuing because you can get that and you've got the gear to get the tone, mm. then you record the tone and each time you're laying the guitar down, you don't notice the energy's dropping a bit and yeah. a bit, especially with the stuff that I do. Yeah. Especially with my bass playing, or even when I'm playing guitar. When I did the when I did the Space Frogs first album, I spent ages doing layering tracks and tracks. It wasn't in a computer and it was like absolutely bang on, but it was cack. There was nothing there. Mm -hmm. I went in on my way home from the nightclub, full of ale, my mate Les Paul. I borrowed either it's under rot super bass head, full tilt, rap pedal into it, recorded it all, took the tabs out the DAP tape so I couldn't muck about with it. And there's the energy back. Yeah. Um I do agree with the perfection if you were a Mr. Math Rock boy or you're wanting to channel your inner Steve Vai, mm -hmm. um or channel your inner Oldsworth, you know, mm -hmm. can you imagine him releasing something with a mistake on, you know, it's like there probably is that he would know yeah. that we don't. The, there are some of us who would say it would be difficult to tell, but go on. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would find it, um, I, I much prefer the energy that go. I record all, uh, any bands that I record, they come in, we have the drums in a, a, a room here, and then everybody else is set up, and I'll bung them through a plethora of, uh, amps or whatever, and I get as good a tone as I can possibly get for them as their original tones are going to be so they can get into the music. I'm not bothered about a click either. You know, it's all you've got to do is listen to Appetite for Destruction and you know, do you really need a click? You know, you can go, would they have all sounded great if they were all metronomic? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah, well, um, if I can just share a little tip with you, um, what I, I mean... Because, as you know, this is where I do everything. And, you know, <laughs> it's obviously all MIDI drums on all of my stuff. But what I what I like to do is um, I will just vary the tempo from verse to chorus, chorus to verse, verse to bridge and stuff like that. It, I won't, the whole track won't be at, say, 120. Some parts of it will be down at 110. Some of it will be up at, at you know, as 130 and yes if you are a drummer you're going to listen to that and think yeah that i can tell that's programmed but it does subliminally i think just kind of make it sound a little bit more realistic i mean i'm probably teaching granny to suck eggs mm -hmm. here telling you that but it's that's... class mate. It's, it's it's class it's just it's so refreshing to hear somebody who's thinking um of getting that vibe getting that feel well, working with tempo tracks when we were just mm. we were going to do the second hardcore album. The first, I mean, it was absolute racket. The first um, thing that we did is me and the drummer locked ourselves away for a day mm -hmm. for him to get used to playing to a click that had 32 different time or tempo changes in it. Well, why did we yeah. use it? Probably not. <laughs> Dead right in one. So, so what's your opinion then on things like post-production corrections? You know, like, um, for instance, auto-tune or kind of taking a drum performance or a, a, like beat detective and stuff like that and kind of lining everything up on a grid and make sure, making sure everything's per perfect. Should, should the band just live with that or should... <laughs> Or no, should, should is it your job as a producer to say, no, do another take, you can do it better? No, learn, or... how to play. learn how to play so you don't have to do that. And if you've just made a little scuff coming, do -go -do -go -do -go -do -go -do -go Phil, and you've scuffed, you've come in a bit late, mm -hmm. I'll tidy that up. Mm -hmm. um, if you've hit a high by accident somewhere in a tune, I'll take that out. If you're riding double kicks and they've got a bit messy at the end because you're tired and we've had a mm -hmm. long day, I'll put them right, but I'll put them right before we move on. It's not post-production. Okay. Got you. So then, uh, auto-tune. I don't have auto-tune in the studio. Sorry, John, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. if you need to sing in tune, you'll have to come in, sing in tune. Oh, and then I find it when I'm mixing, just to tidy a little bit up. 
Um, hmm. But I've had too many young singers come in and say, oh, I just auto-tune my voice when I'm done. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't have auto-tune. You'll have to sing in tune. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. And, you know, as you say, you go back to, I mean, I still think of, because I'm because I'm an old fogey, I still think of you know um, Appetite for Destruction as a relatively recent album. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, but it's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, or even you know, I was watching um, a documentary about uh, was it was with Dave Grohl, and he was talking about recording Nevermind, and you know, he said, "Well, yeah, we had all the, the computer technology there." He said, "But it was, you know, it was a case of okay." Let's kind of let's do this. Okay, now the computer's gonna be kind of chewing on that for eight hours. Well, why don't we just record it again? And yeah. you know, it's I think possibly the technology has got faster and it's just easier to be lazy. Um Yeah, I agree with you, mate. I do. I honestly do. I I have a, a couple of clients who come in regular. I'm doing an album with a chap called uh, Rob Neal. Um he's in his sixties, good player, old school, mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. Bushborn Ash, um, he, is, um, he's been really, well, he is really poorly, um, but he's so rehearsed, he's mm -hmm. so prepared when he comes in. Mm -hmm. And I love throwing the cat among the pigeons with him by going, can you just shut a bass on, you know? And it's like, oh, I haven't rehearsed that bit. And he writes everything out, so all the parts are written out, he'll write the melodies out and things. And it's just nice to have somebody in that's as prepared as that. He's more prepared than some of the pros that I get into in session stuff. Well, um, because I've got quite there's quite a lot of I'm absolutely not, I can't get name names. Um, they've come in and then they're not they've come in with a roar and hangover until after them, and I'm like, yeah, I have a roar and hangover, but I'm not having to play. Mm. You know, it's like, is it going to affect your play? And it's um, I, I've learnt loads. Um, you don't need to be a reader to do, you know, sessions and things. And it's like, it's great if you can. It'll mm -hmm. help you loads, help you loads. Won't help the band that you're playing with loads. But anyway, that's a different way. Yeah. So. so that um, that brings me to the, the, the other thing I want to ask you about, really. Um, <laughs> you know, Excuse me. Um, how do you, do you want to just describe as succinctly as possible, how you got to where you are today, being like having a career in music and, you know, because every, every kid who gets their guitar and learns the first power chord and maybe plays, you know, with a, with a, with a mates from school in a band or whatever and, you know, kind of dreams of, you know, one day being able to, you know, when they're filling in a form and it says occupation to say musician, how do you get to that stage? How do you Blag get it next? Sorry? <laughs> Blag it next. <laughs> Blag it. So how have um, you blagged it then? Uh, I don't know. Even if it was a blag, it's still been hard work. I don't know if it's been hard work because it's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, when I was 14, um, my uncle told me I wasn't going to be a fireman. So he said, what's your plan B? I says, oh, all right, well, I'll be a roadie then. Um, and I, I just assumed the roadie was the person who set up and took down all the gear. And my dad said... Uh, they might fix gear as well, so I learned how to do. I went to college and did radio electronics to fix audio equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, I had a, a, a route planned out in my head already of what I was able to do. Uh, I got a guitar when I was 15 because I wanted to see how a guitar worked. Um, but as my first instrument, I wanted to be a bass player because of Lemmy, but I didn't know he played bass. Because it was distorted, I thought it was a guitar. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm quite glad I started on guitar because it's like there's, there's more guitars about and the guitar thing. I started writing songs straight away. Absolutely. I was writing songs before um, I was learning other people's stuff, really. Um, mm -hmm. And it, my, my path's always gone um, techie player. Mm -hmm. Techie player, and of them two, it's been studio live, studio live. I've always been. I'm never off duty when it comes to work. Yeah. Um, so, um, it took me till I was in my mid twenties to stop being a bit of a dick. Um, 
I yeah, I can go with that. Yeah. <laughs> 23, 24, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it was like, if it wasn't metal, I didn't want to know. Um, and then I found that I, I could do, technically, I could do all the stuff that I was required to do in the band, and I understood what was going on uh, harmonically, and when I was working our songs out that we were doing, they were all, you know, harmonic minor bass and modal mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and the guy who I was getting lessons off, Tubby Ayton, gave me some uh, jazz standards to work on. Um, mm -hmm. And my my music theory, uh, um, and I go back to the blag thing. If you've got your shit around all the jazz thing and you can improvise and you can blag, mm -hmm. you can get a gig anywhere busking with people, you know. So would you say, have, I mean, this, this is potentially opening a can of worms because... Uh, this is a bit of a marmite topic, but um, music theory, do you need to know it or can you just kind of do it by feel, man? You can do it by feel, but you're only going to get to a certain level of doing it. You're not going to get hired. Definitely not going to get hired. Um, you know, I don't, I, yeah, if you're Paul Kossoff, but you're not now and Paul Kossoff's aren't around now. Yeah. Um, you, you need to be, if you, if you want to get hired, you need to not be a dick. You need to have gear that works. You need to turn up on time. You need to be a good hang. You need to be a better hang than you are a player. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to have your shit together. I don't think you need to go to music school. Shit. Okay. No, I don't. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I think what do you do for a living, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a music teacher, yeah. Um, no, I think... Depends the route that you want to go, but um, I, I always loved Jacko's line, Jacko Pastorius, a bass player, formerly self-taught. I was till I hit, I think I was 19 or 20, and I went to, um, you know, Stockton Billingham College, yep. that music school thing there, and I, I went to that, and I never did the jam band because it wasn't my thing, but I did the listening thing, and I did the, the music thing, and it was like I was busy getting knocked knocked about by big season proper players mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why i wasn't I, I wouldn't be getting any gigs is because i was a bit of a dick really um and i had transport which a lot of people didn't have at the time and i think mm -hmm. um where where it swapped with me is i i started i, I played in a club band early doors and my thinking with the club band was completely different to music because it was work Gotcha. I the bingo. I play the bingo. Yeah. Um, one of the, the leaders out of the band said to me, I used to whinge about putting my gear away. He said, treat yourself to something. Get yourself a couple of bottles of beer. And that's your treat for putting mm -hmm. all your gear away at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. um, save some stuff up. Buy yourself a treat. Treat yourself for what you're doing. Yep. Um, and it made it a lot more enjoyable, even to the point now where I play, I do a deck gig. It's the best part of gigging this, packing all the gear away. Uh, <laughs> and you just convince yourself that it is. But as far as music theory, yeah or nay, I do think you need it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you need it uh, to the point, unless you're a songwriter, to be able to re-harmonise a 251 into something you want to play. Um, I think... Um, being able to communicate with people, the only language you've got is is music, yeah. really. Yeah, um, it's 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 so frustrating when you're talking to somebody and they'll say, "Oh, it's that funny chord from from you know that thing from the bridge of that Beatles song or from that Steely Dan tune. You know that funny chord he plays. Just tell me what the chord is." You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. They knew the shit. The Beatles, like fucking hell, did excuse me, friend. Did sorry. they know the shit? Did they you know? Did reharmonization? Absolutely. What? Here's my. Here's my. Here's, what, while we're on a Beatles thing, I've said this a million times. I don't think I've ever said it in a video, so now's my chance. All of the pundits in the late 50s who said rock and roll is a passing fad and it's not going to last, we laugh at them, you know? But essentially, they were right, because by 1960, Elvis had been in the army and he'd come out and he was making all those awful films. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis was in disgrace for marrying his 13-year-old cousin. Um, Chuck Berry in prison, a bunch of other ones, you know, kind of like Richie Valens and Buddy Holly dead. And, you know, rock and roll was in the hands of Pat Boone, essentially. And then along, along come the Beatles, and, you know, they're um, reinventing the same 
songwriting techniques that Cole Porter and Irving Berlin had been doing generations beforehand, but kind of it had a rock and roll beat and it was blokes with guitars in, in a beat group. And they kind of re, you know, repackaged that, that earlier songwriting wisdom for a new generation. And then, you know, you, when you start pulling apart Bowie songs or ELO songs or Queen songs or even ABBA songs, you know, it's all the Beatles legacy. Uh, it's it's the great songwriter's legacy. Yeah. You know, I think the Beatles championed it and were really good at it. But I think, I'm just reading um, Keith Richards' book at the moment, mm -hmm. and um, it's quite interesting where he's going, because he's a field player, but he'll know his onions, and he'll know when you've got that much mileage under your belt, you're going to be able to go, <clears throat> yeah, I want this kind of feel, like T-bone, you know, T-bone walk mm -hmm. kind of thing, or I want like a howling wolf kind of yeah. thing. And he's, He's only going to be playing in a blues band, so he's all right with that. But I think once you start hiring people, you're going to have to be able to go, yeah, that's a, a man seven flat five that I want at that yeah. end of that turnaround. So going back to a career in music, if, if I could ask you to just pinpoint, if you can, if your memory stretches this far back, if you, if you could pinpoint the moment when you went from being a bloke who played music as a hobby and it was something you were interested in, when was that transition? What was the, the, the kind of moment when you thought, okay, this is me, this is me livelihood now. This, I, I can pay the bills by doing this and I don't need a day job. When, when did that happen? When I left college. Um, was, oh, I can't remember when I joined the Hardcore. Um, it was about 1985, so I'll be about, I think I was about, would I be 19 then? And um it was like, oh, I could definitely see me doing this, but I couldn't, I, I did a couple of them daft, uh, you know, not a YTS, but like the, mm -hmm. you worked half a day a week. Yeah. And um, I just, I'd locked myself away for a long time playing and learning a lot of theory and stuff. Um, and the techie thing always went along in parallel because that was fundamentally, it would be like being a plumber and your, you know, your great aunt Maud sinks leaking and they just go, I was Stephen, can you come and fix me sink? And you just go around, fix it, job done, and you move on. Mm -hmm. I was like that with desks and things, and we did our first recording um, at Impulse Studios, it, the, the, like the home of New Wave of British Heavy Metal. And I had to fix loads of sets of headphones, I had to align the tape machine. I think I did the tape machine. But I remember fixing loads of bits and pieces before the session could start. Um, and I, I, I already had an interest in the mixing desk thing repaired a few of them, did a bit of live sound. When we did the first um, demo with, with uh, uh, yeah, I was really interested when we did the next demo of the studio side of things. And um, Studio 64 had got up and going and I was able to get in there and help them fix the gear and, you know, learn. Yeah, just for, for, for viewers outside the Teesside, Studio 64 was like a community studio in, yeah. in Middlesbrough, wasn't it? Was it was that one in Loftus as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it it wasn't a gradual transition. It was a I'm going to do music for the rest of my life. What well, was there anything that that made it so that like I mean just, I don't want to kind of um, put words in your mouth, but for me it was um, the thing that made me okay. I'm going to have to do this for a living now. Was when I got made redundant from my day job, I was, I was a lab rat working in an electronics company, you know, kind of doing all sort of R&D testing and stuff. And suddenly the early 90s come along and I get made redundant. And it's like, well, I've only ever got one other skill and that's music. So I've got to make a go of that. And that was my kind of moment. Was it a similar moment for you? There was a little bit, actually. When um, I packed in working in recording studios, like full time, mm -hmm. and I went... Predominantly, I've done a bit of freelance work, mm -hmm. um, but I went predominantly um, freelance and started to do little bits of tool managing and things. And it was like my my whole life is made up from this, um, which which was which was quite cool. When I worked as a full time engineer in, in a few local studios, which was nice. So you were actually in the music business before you became a musician. Or, or before you became like, you know, it, your, your day job was music related anyway, is, is what you yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. So I was a, I was a player. 
and I was faffing about in hardcore and I was um, when we recorded their first album and um, the guy who had the studio said do, do you want a job you know which was nice and then I didn't I didn't really have to worry a lot about cash there mm-hmm. then I got Ed Hunted in another studio then Ed Hunted in another studio and it never even dawned on me that I might be doing all right um, what one of the things was I didn't think there was anything wrong if we started at 10 o'clock it turned up at nine um i didn't take a lunch i didn't take me holidays i loved it it mm-hmm. was it was what i did um i would love to go back with the management knowledge i have over in the studio now and mm-hmm. see where the studios would go because some of the studios were class but they were all prohibitively expensive to the mm-hmm. normal man because they were mm-hmm. in the back end of the 80s um when I, become, I didn't anticipate becoming a teacher at all. I'd come back off a European tour, it was really poorly. I have a chronic illness, um, and that kicked off and gave me ass a proper good kicking. Um, and I, I did a, a, a course at college. Well, we, well yeah, you, we, I was on the same you, course with you. you. You stuck it out a lot longer than I thought you would because I didn't, I could see straight away that you could see through the guy who was leading the course was like, um, not full of shit, but like, I am the man kind of thing, you know? And it was like, when the people who came in to do interviews with us were like, they would just drop things in, you know, having John Parr, who did St. Elmo's Fire, come mm-hmm. in to tell you about songwriting, you know? It's like, fucking hell, you're going to take notice of him, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then he's just replied exactly what I said, oh, blag me way into it, you know? And it's like, <laughs> but it's that work ethic behind it. I don't think that there's a lot of um, people getting into the music industry that appreciate what a real work ethic is, what yeah. real practice is. Yeah. Um, it will be. Don't get me wrong. I'm not tying them all with the same brush, hmm. but I think, you know. It's a, it's so, a j- just to kind of close things off, because we've been that in a while now, and um, I don't know if you heard the, the, the dog barking earlier. I think that was my new guitar turning up. Um, yeah. I thought it was our dog, actually. I'm waiting for stuff for the missus as well. Um, Are there any parting words of advice you would give to, um, if you could go back, if you could jump in a TARDIS and talk to the 15-year-old you and give give yourself some pearls of wisdom, some some advice that, you know... 15 or 18, because there's a big difference between the two. Can I do both? Yep. 15... I'd tell me to work hard, be nice, and don't be a dick. Mm-hmm. Um, and just enjoy drinking beer. It's not a competition. <laughs> 18, <laughs> man. I'd get knocked out for talking to him. But no, <laughs> I, um, the 18, me would be sat down with me stood over me then, because mm-hmm. I was a stick insect then. I would have only been about, well, I don't know, at best 12 stone, I'm 20 stone now. And I would say, I would give myself a proper telling off, because I did enjoy the rock and roll lifestyle from 18 to 25. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, some, I don't regret anything. I've never regretted mm-hmm. anything I've done, because I've always tried to learn from things. But I'll be interested to see where where I went. I don't know whether I could be give myself the advice to say be a studio rat or be a proper bass player. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I hit 30 that I found out that I was massively dyslexic, which is why my sight reading is so shit. Um, but I've taught some monster readers. Uh, advice. Nah, them three words, work hard. Well, it's not three words, them three bits. Work yeah. hard, be nice. Don't be a dick. That's um, pretty pretty good blueprint for life, isn't it? And um, well, I think that pretty much wraps up all of the all of the stuff I wanted to pick your brains about, Steve. So, um, is there anything else you want to add? Um, check my new channel out. That'd be oh, there'll be a link to that in the description when this video oh, right, goes cool. up. So I'll get another two visitors. <laughs> um, can you just keep doing what you're doing as well? Because I'm enjoying the Friday nights. I packed in bosom with them as well because I'm enjoying the banter. And mm-hmm. I enjoy you do feel like you're there. And I've got the chat thing nailed now, and it's nice seeing some 
some people that you know in the chat, but yeah. um, you know, it's pretty cool. But um, I think we all need to be a little bit more conscious of supporting our performing arts friends and our arty friends yes. at the moment. Yes. Um, I don't know how to do that. I think the important thing is being aware the shit that's going on at the moment is going to be around for a little bit longer and we don't want you know the people that are the creatives mm -hmm. going because, I mean, we've seen what's happened with education um in america they had the um, a science technology engineer and a maths um and then they found out five or six years into the development of this that they had no creative thinkers so what they turned it into was steam Science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. Mm -hmm. And we put our creative thinkers back. So, uh, and a massive thanks, John. I appreciate you banging on me door for this. I've quite enjoyed it. Oh, I've been thinking about doing it for, for a while, Steve, because, you know, I mean, I just thought it would be a good fit because you know more of the, um, you know, the recording side of things. And you've, you've had, I suppose you could say you and me have had parallel careers all I don't think of what I do as a career it's just it's just you don't when you when you, you, do, yeah. <laughs> you, you when when you kind of brought up the way I do you it's it's get yourself a trade so you know it, it's the career oh, is John, John I've got to cut you off there sorry mate this is so important I come back off a European tour with a band from America mm -hmm. um, I did all being paid I had a couple of promoters and agents and book them people to pay I had the van uh, thing up and I just went around me all see me all fella and I said give us an account this because it was all pre-euro mm -hmm. um to work out how much I was putting in the bank and where the mm -hmm. best place would be to go and um we sat there and there's not like piles like here but there's a lot of cash there there was easily mm -hmm. over seven eight grand and we're counting up and sorting out my dad's going it's about time you got a proper job though isn't it <laughs> It wasn't until I was 24 that they come and saw me live. And my girlfriend at the time, you love this, she says, welcome to Teesside. My girlfriend at the time said to me, mum, how come you haven't been to see Steve performing till he's 24? And my mum said, if he was a welder, would I go and watch him weld every day? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I think that's a good place to wrap it up, mate. Um, as I said, I just thought this was a, a great fit, you know, kind of you and I having a bit of a natter like this because, um, you know, there's there's big holes in my knowledge about, you know, the studio side of things. And I just thought that you would be the perfect, um, you know, say, w wise old sage to kind of uh, fill in those gaps, basically. So thank you very much for that. Brilliant. Thank you very much for yourself. So there you go then. That was my interview with Steve Hoggett, my old pal, that I did earlier. Uh, as you can see, he's got a wealth of information and knowledge and wisdom. And with that in mind, I'll put a link to his channel down in the description below. So check it out. He's not got that many subscribers, so let's get him quite a few more. He certainly deserves them. So... On behalf of myself and Steve, I'd like to just say thank you for watching. Thank you for your time. Look after yourselves, folks. Stay well, stay safe, and above all, stay sane. Bye for now. <laughs>